Shalom, everyone, and welcome to the Torah view of the hot issues at Hansa Garden Suburb Synagogue for week three. Tonight, uh, we talk about Dark Side and Children International. The question is, are tainted funds forbidden or permissible for use? Now, last week, Children International and another uh, U.S. Uh, charity found a sudden gift of $10,000 worth of Bitcoin uh, in their charity, uh, what, from whom they thought was an anonymous donor. Turns out that a little while later, Darkside, who are uh, ransomware on the internet, uh, claimed that they had given the money, they had donated the money, they showed the receipt for having given the money. So here they are, criminals are uh, siphoning off millions of dollars a year from all sorts of places, and then, almost like Robin Hood, giving it to the charities. Are the charities allowed to keep the money from the perspective of the Torah? So tonight, we begin with uh, a source in the Torah that talks about tainted money, money or gifts taken from uh, sources that are not 100% kosher, to say the least, and whether one can use that for holy purposes. These source sheets are found at Hamster Garden Suburb Synagogue.blogspot.com. And the first source is in Devarim Deuteronomy, chapter 23, verse 19. The Torah says, Loisovi esnan zona Shneham. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both of these are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So what are these two items? The first item, es zona, is the money that a harlot receives for, uh, for her occupation. Now, she might decide that she wants to take that money and donate it to the temple. The other example is someone who raises dogs uh, for menacing purposes, for hunting or to uh, chase people away from the house and actually uh, uh, cause damage to people. So if you were to trade that in and use those as donations to the temple, the Torah says that those are not accepted. Now, Ramban Nachmanides explains why it is that those two are not accepted as temple donations. Uh, the reason the harlots take this money that they have uh, as payment and use it for mitzvahs, they are thinking that they can atone for their sin. Therefore, the Torah forbade uh, this exchange of this present for any uh, holy vow, because if we would accept their unholy uh, gift, then they would continue to sin thinking, well, I have an indulgence. I have a way of using, continuing my profession and yet uh, using the funds for a holy purpose. Also, the price, the exchange of a dog, those who use dogs for hunting. So here we see that uh, using hunting generally is not a very Jewish tradition. Uh, and those who use guard dogs, um, but menacingly. Uh, who raise dogs who are brazen and cause damage to the public. But then they say, well, let me just donate some of the funds that I have uh, from the sale of these dogs, and I can do tshuva, I can have an atonement. But yet, they're just going to continue to use their practices, and through these ill-gotten gains, they will uh, seek atonement, and we don't accept uh, such donations to the Holy Temple. Says the Rambam in the Law of Altar Prohibitions, chapter 4, Maimonides says, Kol shein la zora. So Maimonides seems to understand that these two examples are not practical like Nachmanides, Ramban understood. Rather, they are matters of idolatry. 
he says that since they are connected to idolatry, they may not be used may not be used for holy matters. Even though they may be permissible to derive benefit from, it may not be certain idolatrous items one has to destroy. Others one may derive benefit from. So even those that one may derive benefit from uh, are still forbidden for temple donations. What is the definition of the harlot's gift? One who says, accept this uh, this present uh, as your as your compensation. And also, Mishum Esnan Mechir El Gufan says, my monodies. Only the actual present itself, the compensation itself, the body of the actual uh, animal or whatever it was that one gave to the harlot is forbidden for donation. Uh, however, therefore, the prohibition only uh, falls on something that could be brought on the altar. Could go in like a kosher animal and turtle doves and young doves and wine and oil and fine flour. However, if she took money and used the money to buy a sacrifice, that would be acceptable. Uh, let's look at the Shulchan Aruch who says, Oslasos me'esna zona emechir kelev. He extends it. He says it's not just for the temple, it's for any mitzvah item that we that the Torah prohibits using these two uh forbidden uh um exchanges. Could go in basic to like to use it to build a shul or to write a sevterah. However, like the Rambam says, this is only from the gift itself. But if it's from money, mutter liknos bandava mitzvah. See, money is fungible, and you can use that to purchase the mitzvah item. Why is it? Because that item is always going to have, our sages tell us, a shame ra, a bad name to it. So if you brought the sheep, let's say that that one had given to the to the harlot and brought it to the temple, people would say, well, that's a sheep that was used for a forbidden activity. But if it were exchanged out for money, money is fungible, and you can't relate that to any particular act. Uh, and so according to this particular uh, law, money, even though the money may be tainted, would be acceptable. So that's important to note. The first thing we need to know from our first uh, idea here is that maybe money, even though they, it was ill-gotten funds, might be acceptable uh, as a mitzvah item. All right, so that's point number one. Number two, turning over to page two, we have uh, from the Mishnah in Tractate Sukkah, Lulav HaGazel VaYavish Pasel. A stolen or dried out Lulav is invalid for use. Why, says Maimonides the Rambam, Mitzvah, Baba Vera, Eno Mitzvah, a mitzvah that comes as a result of a sin is not considered a mitzvah. So continues the Rambam in his laws of theft and loss. Moreover, when it comes to theft, one is not allowed to purchase stolen goods. There are two prohibitions when it comes to uh, buying uh, stolen goods. Number one, you are aiding and abetting criminals in their acts. And number two, uh, you yourself are transgressing. Do not place a stumbling block before the blind. And so to and so on both of these counts, uh, one is forbidden to engage in anything where there is a sense that it may be stolen. Uh, and so in contrast with the previous example, so in our previous example of the goods belonging to the harlot or to those who raised the dogs, there was something that was specific there about the kind of activity that they were engaged in 
that that activity itself, we didn't want that the uh, product of that activity should be used in our temporal activity. However, here, it's not that it's um, a activity that doesn't smell good, but it's not a pleasant menschlich uh, activity. It's actually theft. Theft is a sin, a clear sin. And so if we are in any way deriving benefit from that sin, that would be problematic. And uh, not only would not, if, it, if we can't purchase from a, uh, someone, from someone who has, from a thief, uh, where does that leave us in terms of accepting charity from a thief? All right, let's look at the Archa Sadikim, which is an ethical work from the 15th century. Archa Sadikim talks about flattery. Because understand, what happened here was that the dark side then is flashing their receipt around, telling people, look, we gave this donation, look at us, look how wonderful we are. And if there's an acknowledgement from the side of the charity, then maybe that's problematic uh, in and of itself, because now they feel good, now they're getting uh, covered, now they're getting honor from their uh, ill-gotten gains. So it says, Archa Tzadikim, Achanifus Nechlechus Tish Chalakim. There are nine types of flattery. Harisha number one, Misho Makabach Harisha Rasha Varamai. If you know that someone that you're associating with is wicked and deceitful, Misho Motsi Shem Ralak Sherem, someone who speaks ill of others, Misho goes on Maman Chavero, or he steals money belonging to others, Vaza Makhnefloi, and you come along and start to flatter them, praise them give them in any way, give them significance, importance, then that is problematic. It's very important that a community leader uh, avoids any kind of flattery for someone who doesn't deserve that flattery. For if they would offer that flattery to anyone, and not rebuke that person, uh, they need to do uh, act properly and turn away from sin. As it will ruin the entire community. Everyone will say, "This uh, person who calls himself a community leader is flattering uh, this uh, sinner." And they won't listen to him when he tries to lead the community. So. For a charity to accept money and uh, give chashivas, give importance uh, to someone who has clearly gotten the, uh, given the money from ill-gotten gains, uh, gives a bad reputation, a bad name to the entire charity uh, by doing so. Says the Gemara in Beitzah. Maybe, let's consider for a moment, that maybe Dark Side decided that they wanted to do Teshuva, that they wanted to sincerely repent, that now that we have this money in the bank, this $10,000 of Bitcoin, maybe we have to assume for a moment, consider at least, that this was an act of repentance on their part, that they felt that, you know, we're turning over a new leaf. Only problem is they've taken the money from all sorts of sources. They don't even know where they've stolen the money from. So what do you do if you've stolen money and you don't know to whom to return the money? Says the Gemara and Beitza, bottom of page two, Gazal, the Enir Dele Mi, Gazal, if one stole and does not, and you don't know from whom you stole, Yasa Bahem Sarche Rabim one must uh, use the money for the needs of the public. Now, it's important to note that the commentators point out this doesn't mean giving it to charity. Giving it to charity will not benefit the person from whom it was stolen. So the notion of a Robin Hood, where one steals from the rich and gives to the poor, that's not what we're talking here. Here we're talking giving it back to the rich. I just don't know who the rich uh, that I've stolen from might be. And so I use it for public uh, needs, such as uh, hospitals and roads and public education, etc. That way, I will in some way uh, recompense the person from whom I have stolen. And so what's important here is to note that uh, it's not sufficient for the charity to say, well, maybe they wanted to do Teshuvah here, 
and I can accept it as, as a form of teshuva, because even if were they to do teshuva, then that money should go to the state, not to a private charity. Okay, we continue uh, over the next page. Um, also, what's important, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein points out that if we have someone who does want to give uh, and does want to do teshuva, and we and has a bad reputation. Uh, so, if I think that that maybe by their act I will be helping them in their journey along the way to teshuva, I have to be very careful not to waste this opportunity by then being machnef them, giving them the honor that they don't deserve, because that will uh, be a disgrace, not an honor for them. Says Reb Moshe Feinstein, 20th century America. He says, uh, It's obvious that, that they need to give quietly, that people should know who the givers are. Uh, there's no need to um, acknowledge and to honor the person who's giving. Because problem is that person will then feel, like we saw previously, that they have the bought off the indulgence, that they have satisfied their their guilty conscience by giving the money now. By giving the money and getting uh, some sort of recognition, that does not satisfy the obligation to return the stolen goods. The only way that one can do the proper, uh, achieve the atonement is if nobody knows that you have given. So the fact that Dark uh, Side now announced that they've given this money uh, is in and of itself a uh, evidence that there's no, that there was no teshuva, no repentance, no atonement on their part uh, with this act of giving. Um, Let's talk generally about uh, accepting money from from idolatry, uh, because idolatry is an example of something that are, that's ill-gotten gains. The Talmud in Baba Basra says as follows: We're on page three, middle of the page. Rabbi Yechonon Zakeh said to his students, "Bonai, uh, my my sons, Maush Amar Akasim Tzedaka Tzeremim Goy Bechesed Lo Mimchatos." Charity will exalt a nation, but the kindness of the nations is a sin. Now, Rabbi Gamliel Amar, Rabbi Gamliel responded and said, "Tzedakah Tremem Goy Eilu Yisrael." That charity exalts a nation refers to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. We are called a nation, a goy. And so, by giving charity, we are exalted. And the kindness of the nations is a sin. Any charity and kindness that the uh, idolaters perform is a sin. Because they are only doing it in order to uh, become arrogant, become haughty through it. So, What's important to note here, and uh, this is a separate share for itself, is the notion of what, who is considered akum, who is considered an idolater. Does this refer to all um, Gentiles? Probably not. According to Maimonides, this refers specifically to non-Noahides, to people who worship idols. So those who we are allowed to accept tzedakah from Noahides, those who uh, do who accept monotheism, but those who are idolaters, if they are giving tzedakah, the Gemara says here, uh, which if they're idolaters, then they are sinful people. Uh, they're only doing it from a place of haughtiness in order to be able to take pride, like Dark Side uh, did with this uh, particular donation, and say, "Look at us, we are so wonderful. We have we have given uh, this money to charity." Continues the Gemara here. Amalehem Rabbi Yechem and Zakai. Kishem she chatzos mechaperes al kol kach tzedakah mechaperes al amos ha'elam. He disagrees. He says that the charity can serve as an atonement, the same way that uh, we can bring a sin offering 
in order to uh, achieve atonement for our sins. Similarly, um, nations can give charity in order to atone for their sins. So it's possible that the act of charity itself uh, is, is a form of atonement. But once again, let's not forget what Rav Moshe said, that to give that money uh, and take and give it publicly and say this is who we are and this is why we're giving is is self-defeating and does not achieve what they're setting out to achieve in terms of the charitable giving. On the contrary, it's it, it makes it a sin and not no longer a mitzvah. Says the Shulchan Aruch, one further point. So um, here, here's here's a question I'd like to pose. The question is as follows. So Children International received this $10,000 donation and they know that there are starving children out there. Uh, and so do they say that, well, we're absolutely under no circumstances are we going to accept this money? This money is tainted. Uh, it comes from ill-gotten um, sources. And so we can't accept it no matter what. But on the other hand, they have children who are starving and they need to feed these children. And so who are they to uh, act all uh, righteous, self-righteous and say, we're not gonna accept the funds when you've got starving children. How do you balance those two? So certainly um, depending on you know, what the law of the land says, we certainly abide by dinner, dinner, dinner the law of the country is law. And if the law is indeed that one may not accept money from that, that, that is tainted, that one doesn't know the source of the charitable funds and it may be a form of money laundering of sorts, then one must abide by that. Uh, but what if we have those starving children? Uh, let's see what the Torah says. So the Shulchan Aruch on page, on the bottom of page three says as follows. So like we said, it is forbidden to accept that money that came from idolatry uh, publicly. But if one cannot live from the Jewish charity that didn't come from an idolatrous source, and one can't take it quietly. Because remember, we have here a uh, dark side that could have simply given the money quietly and no one would have been any the wiser because the money came through a third party and it wasn't clear where it came from. And so if it was quietly done, then there would be no questions asked. But now that it's been in, a, in such a public way, uh, now what do you do with it? So the key is the second clause, if there are people who cannot live without this money, so according to uh, the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch, it would be permissible to accept those funds because of those starving children. It's not so simple uh, to be able to say, well, self-righteously, I don't want to accept those funds. Those funds are tainted. No, you've got starving children that you have to deal with and you have the money in the account now. And simply to, to give it back, and it's not even clear that they would even know how to or where to give that money back to. Uh, it, it's very possible that they truly believe that their charity is a uh, worthy cause and that they, they are uh, feeding hungry children, then the right thing to do would be to keep the money and to declare. We're accepting the money. We completely distance ourselves from, from dark side and we, we don't know who they are or how to give the money back to them. But having uh, taken, uh, having the money now in our account, it's important that these children are sustained, that these children are taken care of, and that's what we are here for. Uh, and otherwise, we know that, that that money will go to a bad place. Uh, so it's very possible that that might be the right approach. So, so to recap uh, from this evening's share, to run through the sources once again, um, just very briefly, the first thing we said is that sometimes we have certain uh, acts that are not uh, completely forbidden, but they're very distasteful. And we don't want to be able to use funds that come from a distasteful source, such as an act of, hol uh, of harlotry. Uh, but having said that, we still would be willing to accept the money if it were, uh, the, the charity, if it were exchanged and it wasn't uh, exactly the way it had been received um, in this 
uh, distasteful uh, uh, form of conduct. Uh, the second thing we said is that it is uh, the one may not derive any benefit, one may not do a mitzvah or uh, engage in a purchase of stolen goods uh, because one is aiding and abetting uh, theft. And so one must distance oneself completely from any form of theft. Uh, the next thing we said is that one must not flatter someone who is a thief uh, and give them any form of, of covered, any form of pride and honor. Uh, the next thing we said is that if somebody did steal and wanted to do teshuva, then they, uh, then they should use the funds ideally for public purposes, not for charitable purposes, but for public use. Uh, Rav Moshe said, if it did come to a charity, it's very important based on that Arches Sadikim that we do not uh, publicize the donor whatsoever uh, because that would be self-defeating if they were doing teshuva, were attempting to repent for their sins, then their name should not be attached to anything. And then finally, we said that uh, that, that sometimes uh, there are situations when one is on the uh, on the breadline and there's money that has come into the account. Uh, it might not be the the best source, but if it's a case of of sustaining those who need to be sustained, those who wouldn't otherwise eat, then one has to seriously consider uh, whether uh, the right thing is to um, give the money back or maybe pass on the money to those who, who need that money, but one should certainly be aware of the local land of the law. And if the land of the law says that that that, that, that money uh, must be uh, must not be kept, then one certainly needs to abide by that. Thank you all for tuning in this evening. Wishing everybody a lovely night.